Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Gorecom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives after they put out important news. With us today, man, we're really happy to have him back because he's like the small cap blockchain king in my eyes. Dan Waslock, CEO, Blockchain Foundry, BCFN on the CSE, BLDF on in the U.S. for our U.S. friends. As the name implies, Blockchain Foundry is a leading North American blockchain development firm. But we're going to talk about how they're actually developing themselves. But in 2020, they generated about $1.4 million in revenue. Recently, they closed a $10 million private placement. A lot of that initial success came from a really good self-sustaining consulting practice, right? With a growing pipeline and potential upside from even product development and commercialization. Uh, for example, they partnered with Binance, the largest digital asset trading platform in the world, to leverage the Syscoin, uh, the, the Syscoin platform. Uh, Syscoin is a proof of work blockchain with a hash rate second only to Bitcoin. However, they're now increasing their focus on product development. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, the, the, the company's press release, Blockchain Foundry provides update on product strategy and roadmap. Essentially, guys, this is a blockchain 2.0 company with real products, real customers, real revenues, and real income. Dan, welcome back. Jeff, thanks for having me. I always love being here. Hey, glad to have you back because you're one of the most knowledgeable guys we know, definitely in the small cap space when it comes to all of this. Um, real big press release yesterday because it signals you've been talking about it, how you guys wanted to move to the product side. Yeah. Explain yeah. to people just the difference quickly, because I understand it, but people at home, you know, what's the difference between the consulting side, which is pretty obvious, and where you guys want to go in terms of building product, which I love because that's where all the real scale and potential blue sky exists. Totally. I totally agree with you, right? And so you know, in a nutshell, our consulting business is where we help other organizations figure out how to operationalize blockchain technology. And we also help them to select the best blockchain for their use case. And that has been really valuable to us and also helped us to gain very um, uh, sort of uh, behind the scenes insights into what the real needs of organizations are from a use case perspective for blockchain technology. But when we're building stuff in our consulting division, we're really building stuff for the client and helping to support their use case. Whereas this year with the money we've raised, we're now pivoting to building products that utilize blockchain technology to deliver value to the end user. And it's gonna be a product that our company owns rather than it being a solution for some other company that they own for their specific use case. And that's big to us because it's something that you know, it's a direction I've wanted to take the company ever since we started. But unfortunately, you know, we came out the door right into a bear market when we launched in you know, publicly in 2017. Yeah. And so we really had to just focus on keeping the lights on, consulting and, you know, keeping things going through that. And that was successful. You know, it did it did get us through the bear market. But now that we're back in a bull market and we have the finances to, to, to develop a product, you know, that's really where we're focused. And one of the big different differentiators with the way we're going about our product strategy in the blockchain space as compared to potentially others in the blockchain space is, you know, we're trying to sell infrastructure. You know, it's kind of like selling pickaxes in a gold rush rather than going up and buying all of the plots of land, hoping that there may be gold in them. Right. We're very focused on infrastructure for a, the new decentralized future that we really believe that we're headed towards. Um, and that's really where our product aspirations are focused. So the, the products are endless because, you know, we're just at the beginning stages. Right. Of, of uh, at least for the layman, we know you're way advanced, but <laughs> for the world, we're just really starting to find out about how blockchain is going to um, uh, impact our lives. Yeah. How do you choose which direction to go in, which vertical to go after? Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Because to your point, there are such a wide spectrum of use cases for the technology. Uh, how do you ensure that the direction that you're focusing on is going to be the best use of the technology going forward? And that's really where we decided that 
we're going to focus on like a, a home base wallet platform that we can plumb all of our solutions into, whether it be uh, swapping tokens, crossing between blockchains, stuff to do with identity, stuff to do with regulations and compliance, um, stuff to do with provenance and NFTs. All of those things will be accessible from our wallet product. But at the same time, each one of those services will also be available as a standalone website, standalone product. So if you need to use Swap as a service or if you need to use our regulatory compliance solutions, you're able to use those independently or in conjunction with one another. And the nice thing for end users is they have a really nice wallet they can use to interact with your tokens, knowing that they're doing that in a regulatory compliant way and also in a way that um, allows them to interact with their other favorite blockchains. You know, we're not developing a wallet just for our blockchain. We're developing one that also supports blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin and potentially Binance Smart Chain and others in the future, right? But we're really focused on getting ourselves a home base so that we can carve ourselves out a user base for the different blockchain-based solutions we're bringing to the table um, and using that as a tool to make it easier to interact with our solutions. So like for example, you'll have this, this blockchain-based wallet that we, that we bring to market and very shortly after that, we'll have compliance solutions for stable coin issuers and also for um, uh, companies that may have cryptocurrency on their book and have to deal with the auditing and reporting requirements around that. In order to uh, interact with those types of products, you need to have a wallet to talk to the blockchain layer that powers all of those different use cases. And so having that wallet makes it really easy for us to um, service a number of different use cases, all from a single product, while at the same time having standalone products around each of those use cases, if clients get more value out of using them as standalone. Devil's advocate, There's a, there are a lot of wallets out there, right? Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate, uh, aside, uh, uh, not from a not from a, uh, a technical point of view, because you point out the great advantage of your wallet, but how do you differentiate? How do how do you how do you get to George, you know, a guy named George who sits in Toronto, and and how do you, how do you get to him to convince him that he should actually be using uh, the proprietary uh, bl uh, uh, blockchain foundry wallet? So a lot of it is going to be through the integrated services that are available in the wallet. You know, we're, we're, we're definitely focused on making the wallet more of uh, a property for interacting with different blockchain based services and, and, and uh, like features and functionality more so than just a wallet for holding tokens. Also, one of our big uh, focuses around the wallet is uh, consumer confidence and support. You know, it's one of the only wallets that's being developed by a publicly backed company. Yeah. And we also have, you know, very strong forward facing customer support. We do a lot of the customer support for Loads Wallet, actually, which is one of our clients. Um, and so we really believe that customers having the ability to have the confidence that a public company is backing this wallet and that this wallet is really focused on, you know, regulatory compliance and making sure that the way that they are holding and interacting with their tokens remains sort of on the right side of the law going forward. And they don't end up holding USDT tokens that don't comply with regulations and may put them in some hot water. Like we are very focused on staying ahead of that kind of stuff with our wallet product and making it so that users can be confident and also token issuers can be confident that by issuing on our platform, they are staying on the right side of regulations and also by using tokens through a wallet, you know, regulatory changes in the regulatory landscape are not going to preclude users from leveraging those tokens because our, to our wallet has unique infrastructure that allows for users to, or token issuers, I should say, to manage the changes in regulatory landscape in real time without forcing lots of change onto their users. Do you see that given the fact that I like what you said about the fact this is a, this is a wallet that's being produce one of the few walls being produced by a publicly traded company, which means it comes with credibility, oversight. You can trust it. Well, at least you can trust it more than anything, more than George's wallet. Yeah. Than yeah. Today because, <laughs> you know, because blockchain foundry is governed by uh, regulatory securities regulations and securities commission. So right. as a result of having that advantage is partnerships 
a real possibility for you as well, where you can go to big, well-known, uh, either finance, you know, finance companies, anyone in the finance world, hell, even the Agoracoms of the world and say, hey guys, we want to get our wallet out there and you can trust that ours is safe and compliant and has everything you need because we're a public company. Does the, or do you want to go it alone and not go the partnership route? No, no, that's definitely part of our strategy. And so, you know, we will be able to offer wallets as white label solutions to companies, but also we will be able to offer all of these standalone services I'm talking about, you know, swapping between bridges, purchasing stable coins, either Canadian or US based, uh, swapping between tokens as a service. Those services will all be available both as a standalone website and as an API. And so while you'll be able to swap between you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum in Blockchain Foundry's wallet, other wallet services will also be able to integrate our swap service, just like there are other providers that, that uh, you know, we, can, we would compete with in that space that allow you to integrate the swap service directly into third-party wallets. And so, you know, how users will be able to leverage the swap services, not only by using Blockchain Foundry standalone wallet or going to the website for swap as a service, right? They'll be able to use it through, you know, Coinomi can integrate it, Trust Wallet can integrate it. Any wallet that, you know, allows for API integrations can integrate it. They can add their own fee on top so that they get a cut by their users using it. And now they're making it easier for their users to trade between tokens without having to go out to an exchange and back all from within a single wallet experience. So you guys are getting multiple kicks at the can here. Uh, that's, it, that's, the, that's the idea, right? Is that, you know, we're going to expose these services to users through our own wallet property and through a standalone website. And then for developers of wallets or other financial services, they'll be available as APIs that they can also earn a rev share on. And so they have incentive to uh, integrate these APIs into their services versus other APIs where they may not be able to, you know, gain a rev share type of thing. I don't know if this is too early, but have you had a chance to get any feedback from partners, the industry influencers who are hearing about your product strategy and roadmap and, you know, giving it, you know, Hey, Dan, I really love this. The industry has been waiting for something like this, or is it too early? Cause you just publicly announced that, uh, the other day. We actually, uh, it's being driven by consulting customers. Honestly, we have, you know, recently we released Syscoin 4.2 Lux or, you know, we were a big part of helping to release Syscoin 4.2 Lux, a major network upgrade to the Syscoin network, which improves security and really uh, uh, regulatory compliance and adds the uh, features of both fractional and non-fractional NFTs. And we have a, a lot of clients coming to us looking to leverage those capabilities. You know, they want to be able to leverage Syscoin's NFT capabilities. They want to leverage that in a really nice uh, uh, user-facing type experience. They want to develop marketplaces for these NFTs. They're not happy with NFT solutions and other platforms. And we want to support all of that. But one of the biggest infrastructural components missing in order to complete that picture is a wallet that supports Syscoin NFTs to begin with, you know? And we know that there are certain third-party developers out there, you know, building wallets that may be able to hold Syscoin NFTs, and that's great. But as a company, we can't steer people to those wallets. Like, we don't know, we don't know the quality of which they've been developed, right? We would hate, the last thing we want to do is steer our customers to some client, have them lose funds in that wallet experience, and then say blockchain foundry told us to use this wallet yeah. right and yeah. so we're building our own wallet that allows for users to um directly make use of the value that's president's is coin 4.2 by uh both creating and managing nfts but we'll know that that experience is you know very top notch and extremely secure and we also as a company will have the ability to make some money off of users who are creating digital NFTs in the wallet itself, right? And so now, like we have clients right now that we are developing solutions for on Ethereum only because that wallet is not available yet. And they've even said, as soon as that wallet is available, we wanna migrate over to Syscoin. You know, and so getting that in place as soon as possible is really key for us because 
we know NFTs are hot. We know Syscoin's NFT technology is top notch, but that infrastructure for connecting users with the technology just isn't there yet. And so we want to make sure that we help put it in place and we help put the best possible version of it in place. And so in respect of that, we've also been beefing up our team a bit with additional designers and UX professionals so that as we come out the door with this wallet, it really is the best possible wallet for you know, mainstream mom and pop type users to interact with these types of technologies because that is definitely the 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 market that we're targeting. You know, we don't that's the, that's the holy grail, right? Making yeah, it I mean, for it, George and Mary and John to be able to 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 use because right now I have to admit, like, look, I know a fair bit about this, and even I'm struggling to keep up with a, a lot of what's going on out there, let alone just the lay person who keeps hearing about it and says, it all sounds exciting and promising, but I don't even know where to start. So I'm just yeah. gonna continue doing things the way I always did. Right. I mean, you know, we like to think of NFTs more as digital collectibles, you know, like you boil it down to something simple like that, and it makes it much more understandable for consumers. And, you know, we also think that there's a lot of potential in that digital collectible space. You know, it may not be in the selling $60 million digital collectibles every day type of thing, but, you know, there are very well-established markets for, normal physical collectibles today <clears throat> that can be easily uh, uh, that can easily be like you know fraudulent you know fraudulent versions of those collectibles can easily be produced today and so digital versions of those that are immune to fraud you know there's a natural market for those but enabling that market and are each of those going to be 60 million dollar sales no i don't think so but i definitely think there is a volume based market for more um, you know, consumer friendly priced NFTs and NFTs that are that are more, you know, collectibles that are more uh, relatable for normal users. And that's really where we're focusing on, right? We're not we're not focusing on selling one sixty million dollar NFT. We want to sell sixty million twenty dollar NFTs. Yeah. And, and look, the, that's the that's the state of the media. They're always going to talk about the big flashy and, and rightfully so. We all like to hear those kind of things. Yeah. True. But the, that's not where the business is at the end of the day. Like right. one collector car may sell for sixty million dollars. But really, if you can if you have a couple of, if you have a few car dealerships and selling cars day in, day out for the rest of your life, that's where the real money is. And that, that's where you guys want to be. So, yeah, I can't wait. I think we should sit down and almost have a separate interview mm -hmm. just on the NFT world. And yeah, I agree. Because it's a big one, right? Like there's lots of people talking about it. There's a lot of hype around it. And I do think that there's a lot of long-term potential around it too. But separating the hype from the long-term potential is, is difficult at times. Um, and I'm certainly happy to share our opinion on where we think the long-term. Yeah, yeah, we got to do that soon. We definitely yeah. got, but thanks for at least telling us that. Uh, let's move on to some stuff that's going on because I, I got to pick your brain uh, mm -hmm. because you've got just fantastic knowledge. So China, uh, yeah, the crypto quake they caused by banning financial and payment institutions from providing cryptocurrency services. What do you make of the news? Uh, mm -hmm. And what opportunities uh, the Chinese say is that the Chinese profits from from chaos comes opportunity. So, <laughs> what, if any further opportunities might arise as a result of what China's done. So, you know, I've, I've personally been in this space since the 2012, 2013 sort of time frame. Um, and in the years that I've been in the space, China's done this more than once, you know. Uh, I forget all the different machinations it's taken, but, you know, once they straight out banned Bitcoin, and then I think they banned exchanges. And, you know, so there have been a lot of uh, uh, different shades of gray to their, their progression here. What I think is, is a little odd is that, China is also, in my opinion, one of the uh, leaders in CBDC, you know, centrally backed digital currencies. Uh, the People's Bank of China is actually pretty far along in piloting their CBDC with, uh, with other, um, you know, branch banks and, and, and locales within China. And so I think as a, as a country, they're probably one of the furthest along in terms of having a real centrally backed digital currency. And I almost wonder if that is some of what is driving this crackdown where, you know, they want their blockchain currency to be the only blockchain currency in China. And now that it's so, you know, they're not 
extremely transparent about it, but they do publish, you know, updates uh, around how that whole uh, initiative is going from time to time. And it does seem to me that it's, it's, um, you know, really coming into maturity now with the, the various pilots they have going on. And I do wonder if this move to, you know, ban cryptocurrencies from them is, is somewhat being driven by their desire to have their CBDC be the one blockchain based. I would think that's obvious, right? So yeah. that begs the question, does Canada watch what China did and the US watch and other countries say, hey, you know what, we should do the same thing because we know Canada's working on a centrally backed digital currency. Mm -hmm. Is there a chance that the entire digital cryptocurrency market gets squashed by governments who just start banning them? You know, I don't think that, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that, um, you know, China has always had a very top down sort of autocratic government, right? Where it's like, you know, whatever they say goes and that just gets pushed down through all the layers and that's, that's what it is, right? Um, in, in other countries, there's a bit more, uh, there's a bit more democracy to be, to be frank, right? And so I don't know that uh, a blanket dictation like, you know, everybody's got to use the, the Canadian CBDC and, and Canada is going to ban all their cryptocurrencies would, would fly. You know, I feel like there would be a lot of uh, pushback from, from just normal citizens on that type of thing. Pushback that you probably aren't going to see in places like China because, um, you know, the pushback yeah. on the government's look down on there. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, but in, in, you know, more Western countries, I think that there would be a lot of pushback and a lot of um, questioning how that is infringing on people's rights to a certain degree, um, you know, and should the government be able to do that? Um, so I think that in the West, they'd have a lot harder time just making that kind of blanket mandate. Um, but you never know. And I, and I don't think that was really on the realm of pot, but... I, it does beg the question where you have to think about it, at least saying, hey, if it may, maybe that's because is the Canadian government, all these governments might be terrified of losing control. Of, well, well of, and that's of, where a different world of currencies that have nothing to do with them. Right. That, that's well, but that's thing. where, you know, we think that regulation is the answer rather than straight up, you know, outlawing or whatever you want to call it, because because then governments can still maintain the same level of control, like because there are other currencies, right, gold and silver are used all the time, right? And, and they have value and governments don't control them, but there's a set of regulatory guidelines that allow for financial institutions and other businesses to know what they need to do in order to transact with that type of value, right? And I think that the same sort of standards needs to be developed for blockchain slash cryptocurrency types of tokens. And that's where, you know, as a company, Blockchain Foundry is very focused because we think that, that is, that is gonna be the ultimate enabler, right? That's what's gonna make governments comfortable with it. It's gonna make companies comfortable with it. And it's gonna make it something that everybody can start to use in the real world because there'll be a very clearly defined set of rules that says you need to be KYC'd and you can only transfer this much money and you've got to report it in this kind of way. And there'll be systems to enforce all of that. And then it can operate just like gold and silver and all the other types of value transfer we have today. Um, straight up saying that, oh, well, we're going to ban it because we're going to reinvent our own version of it. Like, I think that that, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't think that that would be well received by the public. And I think that there are better compromises that still allow for the, the freedom and flexibility that cryptocurrency has always been um, targeted at providing, uh, while still uh, providing the compliance and regulatory controls that make regulators and businesses that want to work with this stuff uh, comfortable. And quickly, I'm assuming you actually would welcome that because something we talked oh, yeah. about, something we talked about off air before the interview is that uh, you can have you can have a legitimate uh, George coin, uh, but there's so many imitations out there mm -hmm. uh, that people are actually losing a lot of money because they think they're buying George coin, but they're buying another George coin somewhere else, and they end up right. losing their, and they end up losing. So you'd actually welcome that next stage. That would probably be a well, boost to the industry. Even in our in the roadmap we published, and you know the wallet is just a first stepping stone to this. But part of what we published in the roadmap was, you know, what we've been tentatively calling uh, Project Peregrine. It's it's a it's a regulatory compliance management tool for token issuers. You know, and what it allows them to do is it allows them to define 
any number of rule sets, blacklists, whitelists, require KYC, custom scripted rules, you name it, that are executed before the transaction hits the blockchain. And if those rules aren't met, then the transaction never even gets to the blockchain. And they're implemented in such a way that they're enforced by the blockchain's consensus, but they're stored off chain. So unlike Ethereum, you know, if you wanted to add uh, 50 different rules to USDC to make it more regulatory compliant, you would be adding incrementally more cost along the way because you're increasing the size of logic, you know, you're increasing the size of uh, the computations that need to be run with every transaction. Yeah. Right? What we've done is implemented a solution that specifically removes that additional computation cost from the blockchain, takes it off chain so that you can have as many rules as you want without creating any additional cost. And those rules can be much more dynamic in nature. And so, you know, what we're kind of uh, forecasting for is regulators coming down the pike with regulations that impact both stable coins and NFTs that push them to um, requiring solutions that right now we already have in place. And so, you know, come on down to Syscoin and, and Blockchain Foundry's products that help you to deploy these things in a regulatory compliant way. And then these issuers, USTC, Tether, NFT creators, all of that can be providing users with this value without wondering if, you know, FINRA or fin FinTech is going to come knocking on their door the next day, you know, and so we're building this stuff ahead of the regulations really coming down and clamping down. But we also are very, you know, we have our ear towards those working groups that are helping to form these regulations and we hear what's coming and that's what's driving some of what we're building. And this, and and this will be part of another bigger conversation because, <laughs> man, there's so much great stuff to talk about. I'm, I'm just going to throw it in. Maybe you can give me a 10-second answer. But the problem with regulation is who, under, who in government understands this industry well enough to be able to put even basic regulations that don't hurt the industry at the end right. of it? Like, even look what you talked about with your solution, how you're taking the regulation part off-chain so you don't add on all these. Look, I've been in, I've seen government I've worked with government. I've, you know, and they're, they're, they're a bunch <laughs> of bureaucrats at the end of the day. They're not, they're yeah. not some magic wizard. So mm -hmm. man, that's going to be a tough part there, but we'll save that. I mean, yeah. Do you think, do you think it can be done or do you think it has to come from inside the industry to say, we'll come up with the rules to, to help everybody? I think it needs to be a, a mix of the two, to be honest with you. I think it needs to be, you know, like with what we've developed, we are going to go reach out to regulators and show them what we've built and show them how it can uh, mitigate their concerns and then use their feedback to improve our product, to address the gaps that they're talking about that we missed or have them endorse it saying, we didn't even know this solution existed, but it covers the bases so, hey, token issuers, use this product BCF and BCFN has put out and we'll all be good. You know, like that is definitely what we want to get to, right? And so we see it as something that is working with regulators. They're not going to know what the answers are just out of the box because like you yeah. said, they, they don't necessarily, I mean, they are getting more and more um uh, educated about this stuff, right? So I don't want to make it sound like educators have no, like regulators have no idea at all. They are getting more and more familiar with the actual technology, but when it comes to the solutions that are available for some of the compliance challenges that they're bringing to the table, that's where organizations like ours really need to work with them to make them aware of the solutions that we've developed and have them validate that is exactly what we need and then steer token issuers that way. And so this year is a lot, that's a lot of what we're focusing on, right? It's first getting the wallet that allows for users to hold regulatory compliant tokens and um, you know understand the variety of sorts of uh, uh, compliance errors that can happen with those tokens, and then provide issuers with the platform that allows them to issue those tokens and manage the different types of transactions and good and bad actors and. Uh, compliance rules that regulators in different jurisdictions are going to impose on them. And that's also a big part of the vision, you know, is that you're going to have different compliance rules in different jurisdictions and you're going to need a tool 
to manage all those different jurisdictions. And that's very much where we're focused. You know, the wallet Man, is just that's unbelievable. If you guys, if you guys get there. And the wallet's just the first stepping stone, right? Like that's just that's just how we start walking towards that, you know, that direction. And there's revenue to be had along the way. Um, but definitely the larger vision is one more around regulatory compliance, making it so this stuff is long-term feasible. And at the same time, making it so it's easy for people to use and people can trust it and feel secure in using it through our product. All right, last question. I have a little bit of fun. This mm -hmm. is an easy one. Uh, uh, Bitcoin has gone through incredible, ridiculous volatility uh, in the last week. Um, where do you think where where do you think Bitcoin ends up? Does it does it continue to fall? And does that matter? because you're more focused on where Bitcoin is going to be 10 years from now. So yeah, what, yeah. So, what would you say to Bitcoin, Bitcoin investors? We know there are a lot of guys just out there and guys and girls out there just speculating, but what's your call and what's happening? Does it even matter in the long run? Well, so nothing I say is financial advice at all and all yes. this complete speculation. Um, I, I think, first of all, I think it, it doesn't matter what happens in the near term, because I do think that long term, it, you know, there's there's more upside to come. And others out there are saying the same thing. I mean, you've got Tim Draper standing by his 250K price prediction. Kathy Wood just today said she thinks it's going to hit $500,000, you know, what time so, frame? 10 years, five years. I don't know the time frame, you know, um, I would say look at typical technology adoption curves. Like I'd pull up the technology adoption curve for the internet, you know, and see see when that started to really reach mainstream. And I would use that as a kind of guidance for when we're going to see, you know, kind of these uh, higher valuations play out near term. I think we continue to see volatility, but I don't really think we're going to see it go too much lower. You know, it went down to 30,000 and that seemed like a, almost a capitulation level for some. And so, you know, I think it hangs around the, the 40 to 30,000 area for a while and consolidates. And then, you know, we see the next big move. And I don't think the next big move is going to be another big move down, um, but we'll see, right? And regardless of if it's a move down or a move up, our business isn't focused on Bitcoin's value, right? We are a blockchain technology company. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I just want to ask you more about Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, and, and I, but just for people who are watching this, right, who may not understand the difference between cryptocurrency and, and blockchain, right? We are the, the, the supporting layer underneath all of this, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or Stellar or Solana, you know, Hyperledger, these are all blockchain-based technologies and any one of them succeeding means success for blockchain foundries product lines, you know? And so that's really where we're focused. And so, um, you know, we think Bitcoin is gonna be around for the very long term, that's why, a lot of what we do in the Syscoin protocol comes from Bitcoin in terms of like security standards and minimum levels of test coverage and all that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's going to go up long term. I think there's going to maybe be some volatility near term as we get more updates from China as to their how they plan on handling the uh, the opinion that they issued the other day. Um, and, and, you know, I think that'll be a big driver for either increased volatility or people calming down and, you know, us re resuming the, uh, the trajectory, trajectory we were already on. Dan, thanks for uh, uh, every time we talk to you, man, the mind just explodes with what the possibilities <laughs> are going to be going forward. Uh, there's a little bit of panic, too, in trying to scramble to understand all of this because we're talking about a completely different economy almost with its own language and its own rules so yeah and fast uh, moving too really right i mean like really we gotta remember that uh everybody was all excited about DeFi, and then almost overnight it was nfts and the nft hype feels like it's almost faded away now and that was only like two weeks ago you know and so it's a very fast moving space um we have a very our consulting business is is going crazy right now you know and so people just have to understand for blockchain foundry as a business, we want to continue to address the insane demand we're seeing on the consulting side while still taking the recent money we've raised and pivoting towards product. And so that doesn't happen overnight. That's not to say that that's not happening. And we have more news coming over the subsequent weeks that'll help to um, open people's eyes in terms of you know exactly how much demand we're seeing on the consulting side. And, and you know, hopefully that'll 
people will be able to connect the dots in terms of, wow, if there's that much consulting business, it makes sense that it's taking a, you know. The consultant side is going to explode. There's no doubt about it. There's just no yeah. doubt about it. Everything, everything's going to explode. So uh, can't wait to have you back, Dan. And we should start having a lot more conversations just in general. Uh, just in general, just to keep educating people. Yeah, well, and with with the product roadmap moving forward, you know, I'd love to be, you know, showing sneak peeks of what we have coming and stuff like that as as we move forward too. That'd be great. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for, you know, being that one small cap company that's blockchain for, there aren't too many of you. Uh, yeah, no. survived the, 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 the silliness of 2018, uh, shown that you're a real blockchain 2.0 company, real customers, real products, real services, real revenues, uh, and, and glad to be along this ride with you because uh, I can't imagine where you guys are going to be 12, 24, 48 months from now. It's going to be exciting. And I think 2021 is going to be particularly exciting, especially as we roll out each of those different product releases we have planned. And we've got other stuff planned too. You know, there's, there's always stuff cooking in the background that we're not allowed to talk about just yet um, that I think people will be excited about. And there's, of course, extremely strong strict synergy with all of that and our product roadmap. And so I'm excited to share what we've got coming over the rest of this year. And I think that, um, you know, investors and shareholders will be just as excited about it. Can't wait to have you back, man. Thanks for joining us. You've been watching or listening by podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, your favorite podcast platform to Dan Wasseluk, CEO of Blockchain Foundry, trades on the CSC on the stock symbol BCFN. And for friends in the US, BLFDF, uh, you got to do your due diligence. We all know that blockchain is going to be massive. It's going through a parabolic paradigm shifting growth phase in the next 10 years. Okay, that's the way you have to look at it. Yeah. Blockchain foundries survived the first uh, crash in, 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 in blockchain space. They're here. They survived. They're thriving. You got to do your due diligence. Get to Agoracom, take a look at the profile page, get a basic understanding of what the company does. And then from there, link over to the company site and you can see it right over Dan's, uh, right over Dan's head as well, blockchainfoundry.co. Get there, do your deep dive due diligence. I wish we could tell you what to do, we can't. Uh, you got to make that decision, but do it, do your due diligence because guys, blockchain is going to be, is going to take over our world, uh, take over our lives in the next 10 years. You got to answer the question as to whether Blockchain Foundry is going to play a small, medium or big role in that future. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you next time.